The situation with climate change is clear. The crisis is not being managed in the way it needs to be managed at the moment. I am Sir Dave King. I have set up a climate crisis advisory group. The group represents the international experts on climate change to be available to the public, to policymakers, and to the media around the world. We need action now. What we as humanity do over the next five years will, in my view, determine the future of civilization. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to this month's Climate Crisis Advisory Group Public Meeting. Now, each month, CCAG gathers to have these crucial discussions on the climate emergency facing our planet, with the overall hope that we can provide the public, government, and decision makers with the most comprehensive science, guiding us all towards a better future for humanity. Because it's exactly that, action, not words, that we need if we are to tackle the crisis facing humanity. Yet, six months on from COP26, what progress have we actually seen? Despite a raft of pledges and promises made by the world's leaders, have we actually seen the changes we all know we need? So today, we're going to put the spotlight back on governments and ask, how can the decision makers who led with rhetoric and promises now be held to account? Here to help us wade through this, we have a number of guests, including Natalie Unterstil, a climate change policy and negotiations expert from Brazil, David Vetter, senior writer at Forbes, and Shay Fumi Adebote, activist and host of Climate Talk podcast, alongside our regular group of experts. Thank you all for joining us today. Now, before I open the floor to our special guest, it would be remiss for me, uh, given the recent green slide election results in Australia, if I didn't invite, invite Professor Nerily Abram to say a few words. Professor Abram, what do you think this means for Australia and the nation's ability to now act on climate commitments? Thanks, Ade. Um, yeah, so I think that there's a real sense of hope in Australia after our elections on the weekend. Uh, it, was, it was an interesting election campaign. Uh, we had our, our former government that was led by the, the Liberal Party, who were standing very firm on um, the, their climate targets. Um, so their, their targets were a 26 to 28% reduction by 2030, net zero by 2050. Um, some members of the party were winding back that commitment towards net zero by 2050, um, but we weren't seeing any movement of any sort of increase in ambition um, from them. Uh, the opposition, the, the Labor Party, um, they took to the election a pledge for a 43% reduction by 2030. Um, so certainly a step up on our ambition, not... Um, not as far as what the numbers say Australia should be doing if we want to limit warming to 1.5, but definitely better um, and more ambitious than, than what we were seeing, and particularly with that focus on what we need to get on and do this decade. Um, so while we had the election campaign playing out, there actually wasn't a lot of talk about climate from the major parties, even though um, all the indications were that climate was a major concern for the voting public. And at the same time, as we were having um, the election campaign, we had terrible floods um, along the east coast of Australia. We've continued to have um, heavy rain along the east coast there. Uh, we also had news coming out that the Great Barrier Reef has bleached for, um, this is the seventh mass bleaching event that's been recorded. Four of those have been in the last seven years. And so really terrible news as to what climate change is doing to the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so, um, 
I don't think anyone was certain of what the outcome of this election was going to be until the numbers started to roll in on Saturday evening. Um, as it turns out, we now have um, a new government in Australia. So we have a Labor led government. Um, so what, what we can expect is that at COP27, we should be seeing that increased ambition coming through from Australia. So at least a pledge of 43% um, emission reductions by 2030. Uh, but the Labor Party isn't going to be able to rule um, just as a Labor Party. They are going to require um, assistance from um, particularly a number of Greens that have been elected and importantly also a number of independents. So this was a real sort of um, swing away from either of the major parties and particularly a number of really strong female candidates who ran on a strong platform of increased climate action. So I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. But I think overall, I'd describe um, the mood in Australia as hopeful. And I, I hope that we see that playing out later this year as we go into those next climate negotiations. Thank you, Nerily. That is, um, I mean, hopeful and hope is what we need. And I've had, um, men, I've been to Australia many times and, um, seen the effects of the forest fires of the, uh, the 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 droughts and you just feel something needed to change something needed to change so hopefully this will kick off um in important change now talking about kickoff um we're going to kick off our discussion um uh with shay uh first and um shay it's really good to have you here could you please um give us an introduction about yourself the work you do. Uh, talk to us about your a little bit about your podcast as well, which I, I had to listen to earlier this week, and it's really good. Thank you very much, Ade. Uh, and hello, everyone. My name is Shay, Shay Fumi Adebote. I'm joining from Abuja, uh, Nigeria's federal capital. And I'm glad to be here. I mean, among the midst of people whose work I've read, folks whose you know, reports I've come across or relied on a number of times in my research. And it's really humbling to be a part of this. Uh, I come from Nigeria, and of course, needless to say, it's one of the states that um, goes by the most vulnerable to the climate crisis, as we all know it. Um, Africa's most populous nation, and then we have, you know, a lot of indices when it comes to climate change and the index. So it's, I mean, it's pretty much obvious. And what I've been trying to do with the Climate Talk podcast is to simplify the old concept, I mean, a lot of scientists, researchers, policy people using the very technical terminologies. But what I try to do is to break it down in very simple ways such that the average young, you know, out of school kid can understand, or, you know, young people, women, market women can have a listen and then connect the science to the realities around them. That's what I do with the Climate Talk podcast. And I'm glad to have been running this for almost three years now, reaching over 10,000 people monthly. And it's really incredible to see the response with which people are um, you know, feeding us back and appreciating the work we do when it comes to simplifying the whole concept of climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, I've also been active when it comes to environmental policies here in Nigeria. I've supported the uh, government of Nigeria a number of times when it comes to environmental policies and youth involvement in all of that. I've also attended a number of COP, and um, I've been working with the United Nations um, agencies here in Nigeria to see that we can get a lot more young people involved in conversations around climate change. Once again, I'm really glad and honoured to be here. Thanks, Shay. I mean, with um, Africa having one of the youngest, if not the youngest population um, in, in, in the world, and Nigeria being such a powerhouse in, 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 in Africa. I think it's so important, the work that you do to, to, to get people um, involved and understanding what is going on with the, with the climate crisis. So thank you for the work you do, Shay. Um, can we get your first question, please? Yes, absolutely. So I really don't know who will be um, responding to this, but I've had Oh, Shay, are you still there? It seems like we have lost Shay, but um, if you bear with me, I have his question um, up here. Let me just, uh, let's get here. There we go. 
So um, Shay's first question was, um, as it is currently, the UNFCC's framework accommodates different parties to make a joint pledge on issues like deforestation, phasing out coal, um, et cetera. However, we have seen a pattern where some countries, ah, oh, you're back, Shay, I'm just reading your, your, your question out, but if you're, as you're here, you can go for it yourself. Yes, yes, I think it was the network, but I'm back. Yes, so my first question is, I want to understand, as it is currently, the UNFCCC's framework, as we understand it, it sort of accommodates different parties, different countries, to come under a you know, joint pledge or agreement. So it could be an area of deforestation or pissing out coal, like we see in COP26. Uh, but what I've seen is that there is some pattern such that some countries cannot really you know, practically adopt a system, um, you know, practically um, deliver on, on these pledges. So I wonder, to make it more effective, is it possible for the UNFCCC to adopt a system that sort of delists countries that are not able to meet up with their pledges? Um, very interesting question. And for those of you at home who are not familiar with the UNFCCC, um, it's the United Nations entity that's tasked with supporting the global response to the threat of climate change. Um, so let's go over to our, uh, our panel. Who'd like to tackle that question first? Uh, Lavinia, I see, um, yeah, Professor Lavinia Rajamani, you have your hand up. Uh, thank you, Shay, for that great question. Um, I would say in terms of pledges that are made, we need to distinguish between the pledges that are made within the regime and pledges that are made outside the regime. So the pledges, including pledges in relation to sort of um, phasing out fossil fuels, whatever is made within the regime as part of the nationally determined contributions that states take on and have sort of a, a docked into the UN system, there is some level of transparency around how states actually meet those pledges. And those are the binding procedural obligations that we have within the climate change regime. So there is transparency. And as a result of that transparency and the sort of informational requirements that we have um, in place, uh, there is accountability that's generated, not just within the system, but also from, a, from the outside to the extent that non-state actors and groups like us can actually tell whether the states are doing what they say they're doing. However, for pledges that are made outside the regime, and many of the pledges that we saw in COP26, the joint pledges in, in relation to forestation or methane or others were made outside the regime. There is far less transparency around what states are doing in relation to those. So the effort, I think, at the international level has to be to integrate those pledges into the nationally determined contributions and the long-term low greenhouse gas development strategies that states have within the regime. And that integration, to some extent, the pressure there is to integrate those will then help with more transparency around those pledges, what states are actually doing in relation to those pledges, and accountability in relation to that. More broadly, in relation to your question about delisting, um, uh, I guess the fundamental sort of point of international law is, you know, and the fundamental basis for international law is sovereign uh, equality and consent of states. So to the extent that states are part of these regimes, they're part of these regimes because they've consented to be part of it. So in terms of compliance with these regimes, if we penalize non-compliance, all states are going to do is withdraw from these regimes. And I think it's important for us to keep everybody on board. So the idea needs to be, and I think that's the sort of model that we're now following, is to enable and facilitate compliance rather than penalize non-compliance. So carrots, not sticks in a sense. And that's the sort of basis for the international cooperative regime that we have in place. Thank you. Thank you, Lavinia. Um, Professor Johan Rockström. Yeah, thanks. I, I, I think this question is so important. And, and um, just, just to complement what, what Lavinia says here, that <clears throat> in the previous regime, in the, in the Kyoto Protocol, which we then replaced when we signed the Paris Agreement in 2015, we had two different lists. We had one list of Annex I countries, the rich countries in the world, the countries that have predominantly caused the global warming, that had legally binding pathways of emission reductions, while Annex II countries did not have that. This was called the contraction and convergence approach that developing countries would gradually converge 
in the same level of emission reductions as the rich world, but the rich countries would, would go further, faster, and would be legally bound to those reductions. In Paris, based on all the science we have, it was understood that it's too late for that kind of approach. There is no safe landing for anyone if we allow uh, certain countries to go slower than other countries. So what happened in Paris, which is an enormous breakthrough, was a legally binding agreement. It's legally binding, exactly as Lavagna says, that all countries in the world have to develop their nationally determined contributions, the NDC plans, the plans to phase out fossil fuels and reduce emissions. And it even says that it should be aligned with science. It's legally bound to follow the science. It should follow the IPCC. What is voluntary is the content in those plans, which is a bit of a, a special situation to have in a, in a, in a legally binding uh, framework that you actually have these voluntary contribution opportunities. But that's the case. That's what we're living with. And I'm personally quite critical to that. I don't think it's, it sound, it it's working like very of, well. Yeah, and it sounds like a bit of a contradiction there. It is a contradiction. And, and I and many with me are very critical to this because it, it allows for countries to... Uh, to basically fill in whatever they want in the NDCs while they're obliged to do those NDCs. And the only guarantee we have is that everything should add up to the carbon budget that is required to have any chance of holding the 1.5 degrees Celsius limit. So, so we have a contradiction in the framework, I would argue. Not everyone agrees with me, but I think that is a challenge we have. The good thing, though, with this structure is that we can put pressure on countries and keep countries accountable. And everyone agrees, I would argue, that uh, uh, the big economies, the wealthy economies in the world that has caused primarily, that the biggest causes of the global warming and that today have the largest capabilities of, of reducing emissions, need to have, let's say, NDCs with, an, with the highest level of ambition and delivery levels. So there is kind of an, a recognition of, of, the, of the old principle of contraction and convergence. But the, chick, the trick today is that if India doesn't have a science aligned NDC plan, we will all, all in the end fail by not reaching the 1.5 uh, landing zone. So, so it's really, really complex and challenging, but, but that's the regime we have today. Thank you, Professor Johan Rockstrom. Um, so, David, I can see you have your hand up. Just a minute. Very, very quick uh, contribution. There is one other factor. I agree with everything that both uh, Lavender and Johan have said, but I would like to add one major reason why we changed the situation in Paris, and I was a negotiator then, was to get America on board. It was to enable the President of the United States to sign an agreement without taking it through his Senate and Congress. And no American president, even today, has a safe majority on these issues. So in other words, we, we devised this uh, system where countries would put forward their own plans for reduction in emissions, uh, but without being um, driven to those plans by an international body. As soon as that happens, the President of the United States would need to go to Congress and Senate for approval. And given that, it has softened the process. And I agree with Johan. There are unsatisfactory results from that. But nevertheless, what we have to focus on is that transparency that Lavanier referred to and the fact that we, CCAG and others, can hold government's feet to the fire. It's that business of going public with your promises and showing whether or not you're holding to those promises. Thank you, Sir David. Um, Shay, great first question um, from you. And as you can see, it's it's quite a complex um, situation and, and, and answer. And I, I know it's probably not conclusive for you, but I, I hope we've gone some way to answering your question. I know you have another one. Um, get, go, why don't you go for it now for us, please? Yeah, sure, sure, I'm happy to go for it. Thanks a lot for all those responses. I think it's well thought out and uh, honest also, not just fitting the question and saying the right things. And it's, <laughs> it's good to hear that from uh, folks like you. The second question is, I mean, particularly directed at, at um, you know, the Climate Change Advisory Group that you are. And I want to know, what would you consider 
pretty much a follow-up on the first question. But he, I mean, with the years of work and the effort you've been putting into all of this conversation, what would you consider as the most effective approach that you've adopted in responding to the climate crisis? And how well did it work? Mm. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really good question. Um, I think, may, oh, I see Professor Mark Maslin. You have your hand up there. Go for it, Mark. So I'm not sure we can give you concrete examples, but I think what the advisory group is doing is changing the conversation. And I think that for many years, we have just discussed the threat of climate change and the impact. We are now discussing the challenge around how do we go net zero as a globe by 2050. But actually what we're missing is the bit that we add in, which is the opportunities. So, for example, we now know that air pollution from fossil fuels alone actually cause the premature deaths of 10 million people per year. Compare that with COVID. COVID has killed 2 million people over two years. But we sort of seem to forget about this sort of pollution crisis. And I think the conversation we're trying to change is that we can talk about reducing greenhouse gases, which has positive effects on both the human health, but also on the planet. We can also talk about adapting to climate change, which is really essential and will be a focus of COP27 because climate change is already happening. People are already being uh, greatly affected about it. And we also have to actually take on the challenge that we can repair. We're able to reforest, rewild, and actually repair the natural systems. We have to realize that our impact can be both negative as it is now, but it also can be positive. I also think we are, as a group, countering that classic economics that it's going to cost us so much money to deal with climate change. If you just look at, say, the downdraw project, it suggests that if we go net zero in the most efficient and, I would say, socially sort of uh, democratic way possible, then it could save us $46 trillion. So it's basically this group is trying to change the conversation and show how important it is to go net zero and all the positives that will actually occur because of it. Mm, I think that's a really good answer, Mark, as well. And, and you know, it's it, it's also about, it's knowledge is power. And this is about bringing knowledge um, from a wide range of group of people from all over the world who are bringing their extensive knowledge from their localities. And we're sharing it to people because I think that's still, we still take for granted that people know um as as much as they should know about climate change and I think or the, or, or the climate crisis and I think what this group helps to do is spread that knowledge now Mark mentioned reduce and he mentioned repair but our, 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 our motto is reduce remove repair those are the three things that we have to get out there and that people need to understand if we're going to tackle this climate climate crisis um have we got anyone else who would like to Answer this. Ah, I see Professor Laura Diaz, Anadon. Thank you, Aden. Thank you for the question, uh, Shay. I agree with everything uh, Mark said, and uh, but I will just add that in addition to pointing out some of the opportunities, some of the co-benefits from uh, tackling climate change, I think one of the things we're trying to do in this group, and, and I'm sure more widely in our um, other professional roles, is to uh, to provide a sense of what has worked and what may work and what are important considerations. So one of the threads that we've been trying to highlight throughout the various um, events is the importance of bringing in uh, uh, people, empowering people, consulting people, and looking out for the interests of the most vulnerable. Um, while we learn about what sort of efforts have worked to lower the cost of renewables, to bring in electric vehicles, to um, to plant for us to make sure that local communities benefit. So I think that's that's something that we're trying to do. And um, I think these lessons that we're bringing from all over the world can be helpful in informing um, efforts in different places. So it's, uh, I, and I, I think, at least for me, this is, the hope is that this is going to provide a hub for learning across different places about how to best um, tackle climate. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. That was that was great. 
And Shay, um, thank you for both of those questions. Um, really, really interesting. And um, yeah, please carry on the, um, the the important work you're doing in Nigeria with your podcast. And, and hopefully we'd like to see you back on here on, on our live stream again in the future. We'll be happy to. Thank you indeed and well done. Excellent, excellent. All right, it's time to hand over to uh, Dave Vetter. Dave, uh, you are a regular guest and it's uh, great to have you here with us again. I uh, saw you recently wrote a piece on the progress made since COP26. Um, do you want to share your perspective? Oh, hi, everybody. Uh, great to be here. Great to see you all again. Thanks, Ade. Um, <laughs> well, my perspective is uh, we've not seen that much progress since COP26. Um, and so I, I had some questions about why that might be, um, and particularly on emissions. And as we've seen since um, this rebound, as, as uh, economies have reopened um, following lockdowns, um, we've seen emissions shooting right back up and we've seen more use of coal and uh, fossil fuels overall. Um, so I wanted to get to the heart of why we've seen so little progress following COP26 on reducing that. And I know it's just six months, but um, firstly, is, is climate action at the national and international level principally a political challenge or a political challenge? Um, when we talk about the political challenge of climate action, to what extent is that a reflection of the political power wielded by the fossil fuel lobby? And how do we go about dislodging that political power? So that's to... Oh, I'm a member of the panel. I love you, Dave. You just come in with the easy questions. All good. <laughs> uh, all right, let's see. Um, Mark, Professor Mark Maslin, you've got your hand up. Um, which one of those three questions would you like? <laughs> oh, so I'm going to address uh, <coughs> Dave's question about the political power of the fossil fuel industry. And I think we have to step back. And I, I have to say, I've said this before within this group, which is we have to understand the fossil fuel industry. So if you take the 25 largest fossil fuel companies in the world, 19 are either part or fully owned by a state. So therefore, when we talk about sort of like uh, fossil fuel companies, we look at BP and Shell. But the thing is that as countries, we can manage those, we can regulate them, we can actually sort of deal with those. But the state owned ones are getting subsidies, they're getting tax breaks, they're getting preferential treatment. And therefore, what we need to do is think about how we change that uh, dialogue. Firstly, the subsidies are about half a trillion dollars per year. And I have to say the worst offenders, of course, are the USA, EU, UK and China. And we also then have to sort of step back and say when people say, oh, you know, climate change is a failure of capitalism. No, it's the failure of nation states to actually understand that the petrochemical dollar is a short term gain and a long term loss for the planet. I think really what is important is that the richest countries new, do need to step up. That 100 billion small change has never turned up, but we need that money to help the least developed countries move away from fossil fuels to renewables. Okay, we need that to actually support them. We also need the finances of the globe to actually change. I mean, one of the things we discovered last year before COP26 is that renewables, cheaper to actually uh, build, cheaper to run, cheaper to maintain, and guess what? Stable income, and also it means that you're not beholden to international wars or sort of like uh, changes in the volatility of oil and gas prices. But when you as a country want to borrow money to actually build energy, the international banks and countries will charge you a higher percentage for renewables than for a coal-fired power station. Why? When you talk to them, well, they're not sure. Uh, well, you know, it's because it's uh, older technology, therefore it's safer, etc. They haven't even looked into their own black box about why they charge different percentages. So stupid things like if we can just set the percentage of that the same, it then changes the dynamics. So I think really we have to get into the heart of the fossil fuel industry and understand it is state controlled, not the private sector we have to deal with. 
great answer, Mark. Um, Tiro, I, I, I saw you had your hand up a little bit earlier. Dr. Tiro Mustanen. David, <clears throat> best of greetings from the north in the Boreal in Finland. Um, a quick take from a slightly different angle. Uh, some of the solutions in the Arctic have been able to put in place one element that might be um, not really addressing the the link between the states and the petrol companies, but influencing land use. And that, that has to do with uh, recognizing rights of communities and creating land claims or final agreements, for example, as in the case of Northwest Territories in Canada and some parts of Alaska, where uh, if we are to accept the fact that petrol industry will be here still for a long time, at least there would be some element of restitutive rights, co-management, and what I'm really after here is the defining legally the uses of the land. And uh, when we have looked at, for example, the ongoing conflict in Alaska, over never-ending discussions on the <clears throat> Anwar, uh, what to do with the protected area, whenever there is a Democrat president in power or Senate, they will say, oh, we will never allow drilling there. And then the minute we get to some other parties, it will be up for uh, contested discussions. And that's why, while we are, of course, realizing everything that's kind of implied in your question, I think one of the models for the Pacific, um, uh, the other parts of the Arctic, Greenland, Faroe Islands, Fenoscandia, and North and so on, could maybe benefit from this notion of uh, legally binding zoning and, and recognition of, um, uh, shall we say, rights and, and uh, duties and, and uh, land use and ocean use. That has been to put to certain effect. And the last thing I'll, I'll say is that uh, with this co-management and land claim proceedings that have happened, for example, in the Inuvialut area in NWT, has come a very rigorous screening process for gas and all processes that have included restitutive rights and, and inclusion of indigenous people's um, voice and knowledge. And we shouldn't dismiss these uh, maybe more practical and, and regional level solutions in trying to um, address this particular question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tiro, always bringing it back to the reality of the, the regional, the local people. Um, which is great. Uh, Professor Yi, I saw you had your hand up earlier as well. Yeah, th thank you. I share uh, David's uh, view that little progress has been, been made since the uh, COP26. There are, uh, of course, some long-term factors, as uh, uh, Mark just analyzed, and some short-term factors. The, in the last year, two years, and we've seen this uh, uh, economic recovery from this COVID-19. This is a, uh, this has created some, uh, you know, some panic responses in, in burning fossil fuel. And we see, have seen this in, in uh, almost everywhere. Then there is the last uh, few months, and we see this, uh, the biggest change in geopolitics and conflict invasion of Russia, invasion of uh, Ukraine by Russia over there that's created this uh, uh, panic responses again, you know, worrying about the energy security and reopening of coal mines in, in different places and utilizing the uh, fossil fuel to, uh, you know, to, to fulfill the need for, uh, for energy. I think that this is also a very, very important factor. Unfortunately, that factor probably will last for a long time now, now that we're not seeing the, uh, uh, the, you know, the, the, the promising trend for this, uh, the globalization that we've seen in the past is almost gone. And uh, there's more conflict and uh, is expected. So I think this is really worrisome. You know, listening to uh, the speech by uh, George Soros uh, on Davos, right? Uh, Johan just returned from there. And, uh, you know, many like him talking about climate change, you know, in view of this geopolitical conflict, 
climate change, COVID-19 has to come the second place, you know, not the priority. Right? We have seen this kind of views in, in, in just numerous uh, people and places. So I think that that's a is a is a grave concern you know, for climate change. Thank you, Professor Ji. Um, I saw Johan, you had your hand up earlier as well. Yeah, thanks. No, I really wanted to, to follow on on, on CA's uh, reflections here. I, I, I think we we must simply accept that uh, we have very weak policy leadership in the world. Um, th this is a, a deep concern. Uh, political leaders in general tend to operate like like weather vanes. You know, it, it's a question of where where does where's the where's the wind blowing, and and they jump in that direction. And it's exactly what Wuxie uh, points out here about the panic moves on uh, backtracking on on uh, the emission trading scheme decisions in the European Union on. Um, reducing taxes on diesel in the Nordics um, as, as kind of short-sighted, completely uh, you know, misaligned and, and on the longer term, destructive policy measures if you really want to do exactly what Mark pointed out earlier, move towards more resilient, energy independent and democratic pathways for the future. So, so this is a deep concern that we have such weak leadership and it's, and it's uh, uh, characterized by fear and, and there's a mismatch here because we know from opinion polls that roughly 70% of populations across the world are deeply concerned about climate change and want climate action. So there's a mismatch. And, and, and the, we come back to the issue of, of the vested interests and then all the, the pressure points on, on politicians. And I think we have to be very clear about this, that, uh, that, that the pressure on political leaders must, must continue rising because uh, there is a potential there's a paradox here that the weak leadership can actually play in our favor because with the right pressure, the, the wind will blow in a direction where political leaders will, will, will recognize that that's where they will secure their votes. I'll give you one example. The, 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 uh, the elections here in Germany that, that put uh, the Green Party and the Social Democrats into power after Chancellor Angela Merkel was a climate election. And every political party in Germany had to have a credible climate political agenda to have any chance of, of participating in the elections, even, even the far right. So, so you know, you, you, you can move this dial, I think, quite fast. And then secondly, just, just a completely different reflection, which I think is really important uh, in, in the six months down the Glasgow line. What happened in Glasgow? Well, it was a turning point on two accounts. To begin with, all the texts are now finalized. There's nothing more to negotiate. It's finished. All the text is in place and agreed. So now it's no longer, we're not, we don't have to spend political time on fighting over text. There's only one thing to now uh, fight over and it's delivery. And number two, all the pledges are also in place. All the, all the target setting and the goals are there. We have over 100 countries in the world that have pledged net zero pathways. They're not all aligned with science for sure, but they land between 2040 and 2060. Essentially all of them, India lands 2070. But it's quite interesting that uh, basically 80% of global emissions are now tied in to, to different forms of, uh, of pledges and science-based targets. So there's only one, uh, one issue that we should focus on, which is accountability which is really to measure and, and, and forcefully uh, put into the public domain how our countries, companies, cities, communities doing in relation to all the pledges that have been made. And I think that is increasingly recognized, and, but it, we're, we're moving a bit too slowly on this. But I think, Mark, that, that's, that to me at least is, is like the number one issue now to, uh, to hold the countries accountable. And, and we can do that, as, as you know, because we... We have the data capabilities of doing that even objectively from external sources with all the satellite-based uh, imagery, even of methane flows from different point sources of industry. I mean, it's quite, quite exciting how much technology has advanced there. Thank you, um, Professor Johan Rockstrom, for 
actually bringing us back to the main theme of our uh, of, of today, which is where are we post COP26? And I think what was a really good start point is that because of weak leadership, the power is in our hands. We can shift things, you know, if we demand um, that that we have our governments have more policies that are environmentally friendly, that are green as well. Um, so, David, I see you have your hand up as well. If you just unmute, so Dave. Yep. Uh, so I, I've just, again, got a very short point because my colleagues have all put in very, very good responses. But the question hasn't really been addressed, which is uh, the, the political power of the fossil fuel lobby. And I, I do think this is a critically important issue, because if we look at the United States, uh, the question there is we all understand the power of the lobbies, particularly after this school shooting disaster in Texas. The, the, fossil, the, the fossil fuel lobby, the gun lobby, the cigarette smoking lobby, etc. These lobbies become powerful because they work in Washington, D.C. They work closely with senators and congressmen. And this is the basic reason why the United States has failed to provide consistent leadership on the climate change issue right from 1992 to the present day. I don't think we can eliminate this because the funding of the anti-climate science group and groups around the world has come very heavily through the United States uh, lobby system. And that has impacted on the English speaking world in particular. So I just want to say, yes, this is a very important question. If you want to know why President Obama, for example, didn't have a majority in Senate and Congress and why Biden is now struggling in the same way, it's because of how many people are, can I say this, in the pockets of, uh, of those fossil fuel lobbies. Now, I'm not, that's not to disagree with Mark or anything that's been said, but I just thought your question really deserves a direct reply. Thank you for that direct reply, um, Sir Dave. Um, David, I hope uh, we managed to tackle some of your questions there. Uh, you gave us some quite challenging ones, but I hope we, uh, we got to, to some of the, the nub of your questions. Thank you, and um, we'll hear from you again, hopefully. Right, next up, we have a question from Natalie uh, Unterstel, who is uh, going to share her experience of climate change in Brazil um, and where the nation stands on their COP commitments. Now, Natalie has sent her her thoughts via video, so let's go through that, please. Hi, I'm Natalie Unterstel. I'm the president of Talanoa, which is a climate policy think tank from Brazil. I've been experiencing uh, firsthand the effects of the climate crisis in the record high floods, uh, never seen on the scale they've happened this year here in Brazil. And also it's very concerning uh, what's happening vis-a-vis -vis the Amazon rainforest. We already lost 20% of it, but uh, the combination of high and persistent rates of deforestation with climate impacts put the whole forest uh, at the risk of a tipping point um, if we cross uh, the 25% um, loss of it. So uh, Brazilians are working hard to avoid that tipping point to also to protect people and, and, and to uh, speed up the transition to a low carbon and resilient economy. That's precisely what we would like to see in practice uh, happening in the real economy with government support, but not necessarily uh, this is what's coming from, from the government as policy signals and so on. So at COP26, the Brazilian government committed to, to various uh, various pledges, including net zero by 2050, um, pledges to uh, reduce methane and deforestation related emissions by 2030. But that has not been translated into actual policies, procedures, process uh, so far. And the track record from Glasgow uh, uh, onwards, uh, it's a very negative one. So there was a surge in deforestation in the past six months, um, according to official data, 
and uh, we really see that Brazil needs a, a course correction in that end uh, if it is to deliver uh, real permanent and additional reductions. Also, um, there are significant holes in the announcements that were made, particularly Um, on the new targets of uh, Brazil's NDC that uh, were announced at the COP. So Brazil uh, pledged to cut emissions by half by year 2030. And unfortunately, when we look at the numbers, there, the government has been playing a lot of tricks around it. So actually, besides uh, the increase from a former pledge, a first pledge of reducing 43% in 2030 to now 50%. The base numbers used to calculate these targets, they've been adjusted since the first pledge um, uh, was made right after the Paris um, Agreement in, in 2016. So uh, this new target announced at COP26, it actually translates in an increased uh, of emissions um, during this decade. And this increase is the size of Colombia in terms of annual emissions by 2030. And uh, also it adds an entire pollen, so more than 200 million uh, tons by 2025. So this clearly represents um, a backtracking uh, in terms of uh, binding commitments uh, that Brazil submitted by the UN in the past. And this also means that Brazil is not contributing to uh, achieving the greatest ambition possible in the short term as requested by the Glasgow uh, Climate Pact. Uh, so Brazil unfortunately is not on track and um, needs uh, a complete overhaul of uh, its current uh, situation. Thank you very much, Natalie, um, for those quite alarming insights, actually. Um, I'm going to pan over to Professor Mercedes Bustamante um, to see uh, for a second and to ask you whether you've got a familiar view of where Brazil stands on its climate commitments. Yeah, uh, thank you. I, I, I agree with uh, Natalie on, on her comments, and I think uh, this is part related to David's questions about the political challenge that is related to climate change. What we see now in Brazil is the political situation is quite polarized. So it's really that climate change is an issue of the left, of the right wing, and this is quite bad for the debate because it's not a, a, a issue that is only a, an interest of the left wing parties. And uh, also uh, listen the uh, narrowly uh, report on Australian elections. We are also going to have uh, presidential elections in Brazil end of this year. But unfortunately, uh, climate change is not a big issue for this presidential election. So really, uh, we have uh, a crisis that was related to the Brazilian response to COVID-19. So poverty levels are increasing. And these issues are also impacted by the energy crisis related to the Ukraine war. So I think that for most developing and less developing countries, the issues around poverty uh, and how countries are going to face uh, uh, poverty challenges, health challenges, developing challenges is, is still hindering a good response in terms of climate change. So, uh, and Tero also mentioned, uh, I, I think a quite important issue that is related to land use and the rights of indigenous peoples. That is also quite important in most developing countries because indigenous peoples, they, they are the custodians of most of the still preserved areas in, in Brazil and South America and Africa and also in Asia. So I think this political uh, challenge that is related to climate change is much larger than just the fossil fuel industry. We really need to, to put, um, the issues in terms of, of developing for the global south uh, as an important part of this equation. Without tackling development issues, we are not going to solve climate change. Thank you, Professor Mercedes Bustamante. 
Um, we're now going to head to another video of Natalie where she's got some questions to ask of our CCAG scientists. Given that currently the UN does not penalize countries who are not uh, aligned with the Paris uh, goals, what would you do differently to hold these countries accountable? Great. And given uh, the high risks involved in uh, the tipping point of the Amazon rainforest, what would you advise the international community? What should be done from now to 2030? Two great questions there from Natalie. Um, Who would like to tackle this one first? Uh, Lavinia, Professor Lavinia Rajamani. Uh, thank you. Great questions from Natalie, indeed. Um, and a depressing report from Brazil, but one, uh, you know, unfortunately familiar, a depressing report from Brazil. Uh, I'd like to take a sort of legalistic uh, sort of uh, perspective on this and sort of speak to some of the legal points here. Uh, in terms of accountability and the international climate change regime, one of the interesting things I think about Brazil is that international law, it's a monist country, so international law is domestic law. So it's directly incorporated into domestic law, which, which means that many of, well, the provisions of the Paris Agreement can be relied on in court in Brazil. And uh, there are two cases, and I'm sure Natalie is familiar with them as Mercedes that are actually sort of working their way up the system in, in the domestic courts in Brazil. And um, the points that I think that from the Paris Agreement that are relevant to this is first is Article 4.2, which actually contains the obligation to, you know, to uh, submit national term and contributions. There is a substantive binding obligation to take domestic mitigation measures that are going to achieve that are going to achieve or sort of work towards the ends of those national term and contributions. So substantive binding obligation to take domestic mitigation measures. And clearly, Brazil is not doing that. Uh, and to the extent that they had measures, there's regulatory rollback on those measures. So that, that is a plank that court cases in Brazil can rely on. The second point is in relation to Article 4.3, which contains an encouragement or an, sort of normative expectation that states will take on more progressive national term and contributions in every successive round, and that they will represent highest possible ambition. And Natalie referred to the fact that the latest NDC is not um, is not a progression of the last, and so they've sort of engaged in what has come to be known as a carbon trick uh, in, in terms of the accounting. Um, so again, this is also something that can be relied on to some extent in the domestic courts in conjunction with uh, sort of Brazilian national laws that actually speak to the no regression policy as far as environmental law is concerned. So international law and domestic law can be uh, used sort of productively in cases in, in Brazil, and there are cases uh, in the system that are actually attempting to do this. Uh, and I should say in that context that although it is depressing to see and hear the news that comes out of Brazil with respect to climate change, it is heartening to see the sort of activism around uh, around these issues with respect to the uh, deforestation in the Amazon, as well as in relation to actually using legal tools to sort of challenge this. Um, I would uh, I would also add that there are other international fora in which some of this can be addressed, including the special rapporteurs, UN special rapporteurs on human rights and environmental law and human rights and climate change as well. Uh, complaints can be or communications can be addressed to them, and some of these might potentially be in the pipeline, as well as cases before the Human Rights Committee in relation to the human rights aspects as well of many of the sort of deforestation, um, uh, the deforestation sort of uh, uh, issues in, in Amazon and in the Amazon basin. So there is much that can be done. None of them are decisive or conclusive, but it creates pressure on Brazil uh, to, to be accountable which is what we're all talking about. Thank you. Thank you for that, Professor Lavinia. But it's still, I, because I can feel Natalie's frustration and Mercedes's frustration is, you know, how do everyday people, how do you take your government to, uh, to or, or make them accountable when they're doing all of these awful things? You know, because it seems like it's the same question with Brazil and it's the same culprits around the world constantly not doing enough. I, I, it feels really difficult. Is there anyone else on the, um, on the panel who would like to uh, take a stab at this one? Uh, yes, we see uh, Professor Laura Diaz-Anadon. 
Um, thank you. And, and I'll take a slightly, I guess, pessimistic uh, view on all of this. You know, uh, I think it's not just Brazil, of course, we, you know, as Lavanya mentioned and as Natalie highlighted, it, it's, it's a big problem right now. But if we look across all the NDCs, uh, we're really not on track. So even though uh, we have this legally binding uh, mandate to have NDCs that are consistent with the goals of the Paris Agreement, if we just look at the most recent UN report, um, you know, the current NDCs would lead us to an increase in greenhouse gas emissions of 14% uh, by 2030, when we actually would need a decrease of around 45% by 2030. So I think, it, you know, the, you know, we, we need to keep the international dialogue. I, I completely share Lavanya's uh, desire to not, you know, start picking, you know, um, uh, countries and, and groups out of the process. But at the same time, we're not, we know that the NDC is so far not delivering. And that's then, uh, in, in addition to this, we have all those other pledges on the side. And again, we know we're not seeing the commitments on, on finance, on methane, on deforestation, on coal. Um, and I guess the, the one kind of anecdotal point that I will bring that makes me even more pessimistic, uh, which of course doesn't mean we should stop. And, and I think it makes uh, all of our efforts even more important um, is the what we saw in the context of mission innovation, which is an initiative that I know uh, Sir David played a, a major role in. Uh, it was, you know, a, a, a commitment that was made in Paris in 2015 to double public energy R&D investments between 2015 and 2020, um, you know, from around 20 to around 40 billion. In my mind and in the mind of many people, this is a win-win, it's a very small amount, you know, peanuts compared to a lot of the things that need to be invested in. And even this wasn't met. Most countries didn't meet this. Uh, ITIF uh, uh, and NGO in the um, US track this. And again, very, very few countries met it. And, and to me, this suggests that, again, we need additional action for uh, people, groups uh, to, to ensure that we actually get the action we need. I think the current international commitments is essential. We need it, but it's not enough. Thank you so much for that, Professor uh, Laura diaz and uh, Look, we've got a little bit of time, which we don't usually get at the end of our um, our, our, our live streams. Um, and I think it's it would be it's only fair we go back to to Shay because I know Shay, you had um, one more question actually that you didn't get to ask Shay Adabote. So if you could ask that question, and we'll see if our, our, our panel can can answer this one. Absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I've been learning so much and I just want to say thanks to everyone. Particularly, I love the directness of Sir David King and how he's been very direct in answering these questions. Having, you know, attended a lot of these climate policies meetings, you just see a bit of, you know, playing around the question. So I really do appreciate that. My, my third question, uh, I'm happy to round off uh, the, the chat with this, is basically considering the fact that uh, the United Nations is the highest multilateral lateral body uh, that influences how countries deliver on their climate pledges. I've been worrying, I mean, thinking about it very, very actively, that it appears that the best the UN as a system can do is to, you know, recommend and say, we recommend you do this or to plead with countries and say, oh, we want you to, we're pleading with you to do this and do that. But countries will still, you know, do what they want to do. So I wonder, is there a way of strengthening the UN system such that it can do a lot more than just recommend to the people or recommend to parties? It's a fascinating question because you're hearing this more and more, which is kind of basically questioning the power and the influence that the UN has. You know, what, what, what can they really do and what, how can we make them more effective or what can be done to make them more effective? Um, is there anyone, I see Professor Mark Maslin, you have your hand up. And so I think this opens up uh, a huge dialogue that we need to have, which is how do we actually have international bodies and what are they for? And we have to go back to the UN was set up post Second World War. Its structure is based on who won a war. Uh, we have a security council that has vetoes. Um, and again, it's not representative. And I think what we need to do is somehow in that form negotiate the evolution of many of our international bodies, okay? Uh, and there are so much great literature out there with alternative thinkings about how you would actually change the UN. 
whether, for example, I always argue the World Trade Organization is anathema. We should have the World Sustainability Organization. It should change to be looking after our resources and looking after our people. And I think I unfortunately am not a brilliant lawyer like some of the people uh, in our wonderful uh, group. But what I really want to know is how can we actually make normal people actually have a say in our international organizations? How can we make sure that the indigenous people, the most vulnerable people, actually have a say in the UN and how it organizes and actually tries to influence uh, sort of like countries to do the right thing for everyone? So is that democracy you're talking about there, Mark? Well, I have to say, one of the most interesting conversations I had with Al Gore is he said one phrase, which has stuck with me and resonated. He said, we have to fix democracy before we can fix the climate. OK, and the thing is, as Sir David said, the lobbying that goes on, the sort of like the political machinations, the short termism, the lack of vision of our leaders, I mean, is absolutely horrifying. I mean, I think that's what we need. We need a new set of leaders, whether it is whether it, uh, in a democracy, a limited democracy, or some of the autocratic systems. We need governance systems that allow us to actually deal with the environmental crisis. Because the thing that frustrates all of us on this is that we can all see that actually going to net zero makes people sort of like basically safer, healthier, probably even wealthier because of the dynamic green economy and might even be happier. But we have a political system that won't allow us to go to a better world. So that's the frustration that we have in this committee. And this is the reason why this advisory group is there to try and actually, I'd like to say shake, <laughs> but actually shout at the political leaders to say, look, come on, step up and actually be fit for the 21st century. Thank you so much for that. And I mean, I, I second that. It's about, you know, shaking up the, 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 the system and getting the po political leaders to, to hear this. And that's why I say, if you're listening to this live stream, spread the word, tell more people to join us. We are on every, uh, once, uh, the, the last Thursday of every month. Um, and it's a really, really important live stream. Um, I want to go over to get two more answers. So we've got um, Aranaba, Dr. Aranaba Kosh, and then we'll finish off with Sir Dave. Thank you, Ade, and uh, thanks for that question. I've been um, listening to all the responses for the last hour and don't disagree, but I think this for this particularly the last question, um, I wouldn't want to just use the UN uh, and its kind of limitations as the uh, as the sort of straw man that we beat up on, uh, because it is, after all, a reflection of much deeper structural flaws that we have. So my response, even though it might not be a direct response, is slightly different. If you think about the pandemic, uh, the acuteness of the pandemic triggered an acute response in terms of vaccines. But have we fixed the structural response in terms of public health systems? whether in developing countries or in developed countries? And the answer is no. Uh, if you look at financial crises or that often plague developing countries, currency crises, there's an acute response. You'll get a stabilization package from the IMF, of course, with conditions. But often the structural reforms um, get started, but then they, they stall. So the challenge before all of us is that the climate crisis is not any different from how politics responds to crises, which is that we respond to the acuteness of a problem, but we quickly kind of taper away on the structural responses. So now coming back to the question, I would argue that we are dealing with four sets of stakeholders. There are countries, there are companies, there are cities, and there are citizens. The UN process as it's structured, at least around, around the climate issue, is primarily only dealing with one stakeholder. And those countries or those country representatives are effectively communicating what they think their cities, citizens, and companies are telling them to communicate. So can we actually change incentives at the structural level 
with the other three stakeholders, which means it's the citizen, say the farmer in India, who's dealing with the crop loss as we speak because of the impact of the worst, the, the hottest March since uh, in, in more than 119 years. How does that farmer then say, look, I am facing a structural problem now of continued losses in farm income. Okay. Similarly, cities which have built infrastructure, um, including particularly in developing countries where more and more people are now coming into burgeoning cities, is that built infrastructure that's under stress. So regardless of what happens in climate negotiations, cities and regions around cities will have to respond in a structural way towards making that built infrastructure, the roads, the railways, or the buildings, or whatever it is, more climate resilient. It's, it has nothing to do with what the negotiations say or don't say. And finally, there are companies. And of course, we've spoken a lot about the lobbying that companies do, the greenwashing they do, and they will continue to do. Um, one of the responses has been the new uh, high-level expert group that the UN Secretary General has constituted to actually hold these non-state actors, the companies to account for their commitments. I happen to be a member of that group. We haven't figured it out yet, but we are targeting how we can create those incentives. But suppose we get those structural incentives right for the citizen, for the city, for the companies, then I would argue we would have created the conditions. That reform of democracy before we fix climate change the, the what Mark was talking about, then we have the ingredients feeding into the intergovernmental process that fixes the UN. And therefore, my final point, as I've made, I think, on a previous CCAG briefing, is that, the and, and as uh, Johan Rostrom said today, if we have finished negotiating the, the rules, it's time to stop negotiating rules anymore. It is time to submit actions. And the UNFCCC, as I've argued before, has to become a bank, not of commitments, but a bank of actions. Where the currency comes from what you've delivered, not what you have promised. So these are the four structural changes that we have to undertake through four different states, sets of stakeholders. It's easy to beat up on the UN, but it's a reflection of our collective failure. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Aaron Abakosh, um, for those salient points. Um, so Dave. Yes, I'm happy to come in with a, a very quick uh, uh, comment. I, I, first of all, I want to say that uh, we should finish with Aaron Arba's comments because I thought they were very cogent and really uh, tend to move the ground ahead of us if we can move in that direction. We don't have much time and uh, the point about time is 1992 is when we began these negotiations. We have run out of time now. We really have to move extremely quickly. And I'm afraid we're not going to get the United Nations uh, reorganized into a way that fits the 21st century. So we have to move quickly. And I think what Aranaba set out is a good way forward. Let me also just pick up on what our international lawyer uh, uh, Lavagna said, because I think this is critically important. I didn't know that Brazil incorporated international law into its national processes. And what this means is, uh, it, let's take the example of, uh, of the Netherlands, where a very small NGO took the Dutch government to the courts and won the battle because they had an incoming government that was not following the promises of the previous government that were delivered in the COP process. And this was successful. And the government then completely changed its policies to accord with the, the agreement made in the COP process. So I, I think what I'm saying here is, we're not seeing enough use of the legal system to hold government's feet to the fire. We, we, we can't all use this. Uh, there are many legal systems that really aren't strong enough to carry this through. But I think we could see a much bigger focus on legal action. That's the only comment I wanted to make. I thought the whole discussion was wonderful. Thank you uh, so much, Sir Dave. That was a fantastic way to finish. Um, Unfortunately, that's all we have time for today. 
But what an interesting discussion it's been. Um, with a little resolve and a lot more action, hopefully we'll see more of these promises come into fruition ahead of COP27. Now, a huge thank you to our special guests for joining us. And as always, our CCAG scientists for their time today. Uh, to those who tuned in at home, thank you very much for joining. And if you have any questions for our CCAG members, then please send them over on any of our social media channels. Now, remember to join us at our next public meeting on Thursday, the 30th of June. See you soon. The situation with climate change is clear. The crisis is not being managed in the way it needs to be managed at the moment. I am Sir Dave King. I have set up a climate crisis advisory group. The group represents the international experts on climate change to be available to the public, to policymakers, and to the media around the world. We need action now. What we as humanity do over the next five years will, in my view, determine the future of civilization.